online real estate brokerage, a little bit like if Immobilium Scout had uh, Macklers. So it's like full stack from people all the way to um, technology. Um, happy to talk about that in any of the Q&A later as well. Um, <clears throat> so real quickly, one minute on Get Safe. We are in SureTech. I put that in quotes because it's kind of like a ripoff of FinTech. It's FinTech for insurance. Um, <laughs> What is happening to insurance now is sort of what happened to flights 20 years ago. It sounds ridiculous, but yes, it is cool that you can buy insurance on an app today. For the most part, that still doesn't happen, but it's happening. Uh, so we're in InsureTech. We're trying to um, use technology to change insurance, and um, our target market is uh, people like in their 25 to 35 tech-savvy millennials. And our goal is to use technology to change everything about insurance from how you engage with it to how you buy it to how ultimately it gets um, underwritten, which is the technical insurance term for price. Uh, because if you are a safe person, you should pay less. That's like the spirit of insurance. So that's what we do. Uh, we have a little app. You can check it out. Um, uh, but we're just getting started, so 50 people right now. And uh, I'm not actually going to talk too much about Get Safe today, but um, I have to give him a shout out because I do work. <laughs> okay, so um, like I said, my goal today is to walk to help you walk away with at least one little tool. So let's start by defining the term AI. Now, I will also give you full disclosure because I am not like an AI expert. I'm sorry. I took one class in grad school on machine learning, and it was by far the hardest computer science class I ever took. I didn't understand the back half of the class. Um, when they got into neural networks, I really didn't get it. But I will actually um, argue that you don't have to know too much about AI to be a very effective PM or PO at using AI in your products. So, but let's make sure we're on the same page in terms of how we talk about things. Okay, so these are like two pretty common examples of what people think of when they think AI. Um, Netflix is maybe one of the most classic examples where they started using what's called collaborative filtering, which is just scoring the movies. And then there's all stuff on the right here, which is pretty cool because robotics actually has taken a really good, really big step forward recently because of machine learning, but uh, they're not smarter than humans, as you can see. So. Um, so these are like two pretty cool examples, and um, I went to a conference in London like, a, a, like last month, and they really, really hit me in insurance because it, technology is yet to hit insurance, and everybody's talking about AI, and I walked away kind of feeling like AI looks a little bit like this right now, because there's so many words, and everybody talks about how you should be able to have a risk profile for your insurance product based on your behavior and big data crunching and then out comes the price slightly different than your neighbor. But nobody actually knows what that means. Um, there's just a lot of words flying around and this is too far. Oh, and then, so really like, I feel like the definition of AI right now is more like this, where you can tell somebody you built an MVP, they're like, okay, what is my middle name? It's gonna, it's, and it's like, oh, I'm being, the AI is being shy, and the people believe you because it's like artificial intelligence, right? And so, all that aside, let's level set. For the purposes of this talk, let's define AI as automated decision making. Let that sink in for a second. Automated decision making. And as we go through the rest of the talk, I think this will liberate you because you don't have to think about what algorithm is being used. You can think about automation, and you can think about decision making. We make a lot of decisions, and automation implies it's something we can do manually. And so this, for me, really broadens the way we think about applying AI. It also forces us as PMs to think about the problem we're solving rather than the solution we're trying to shove into the problem. And it also doesn't really require you to know what machine learning even means or how to build an algorithm from scratch because you're just making decisions and enabling a machine to do it for you. So, automated decision making, okay? Okay, now, I have three tips for you uh, for how to use it. Uh, these are things I've learned from my own experiences uh, working with 
artificially intelligent or automated decision making things in product. So the first one is that AI is a tactic that helps solve problems. That's it. Don't overhype it. It's a very powerful tactic, but it is a tactic. That word is very intentional because um, let's do a quick PM 101 thing here. Remember these three really important words, vision, strategy, and tactic. Um, if there's anything we do on a day-to-day -day basis that is the most important is actually knowing what these are for your product area. Where are you trying to go? What do you have to do to get there? And how do you do those things really, really well? And so the word tactic maps to that word on the right. So even for Netflix as an example, let me just make sure I give you some context here, right? Those words are really abstract, but for Netflix, their vision as a company is to become the world's biggest entertainment distribution service. That's their vision. And a really core part of their strategy for becoming a really great distributor of entertainment is through engagement, which means we want you to not use Netflix once or twice. We want you to use Netflix way too much for your own good because you're going to want to come back and watch that next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And the way they do that is by providing really, really good recommendations, right? Now, how do you provide really good recommendations? You could, um, this is where it starts to become decision making, right? Because for every single user, you're making the decision of the next time they launch the Netflix app, what shows up? How do you rank them? And so you start to see features like a rating system, thumbs up, thumbs down, it used to be five stars, four stars. Tracking on engagement so you can have feedback loop on your data and then from the data You can start to derive algorithms that predict what people like and you can even do a B tests on which cover photo is more likely to click on for every single movie, but um, all of AI is here and Our job as PMs is actually to define the vision and the strategy and then the team builds the features so my takeaway number one is please focus on the problem you're trying to solve. Define that really, really well. And if you happen to need AI to do that, to solve the problem, that's fine. But don't start with a premise of you have to use AI. Yeah? Make sense? Okay. Now, you might think Netflix is like this really cool company that's been around for a long time, so they must be really good at what they do. And, and it's kind of, but I want to make this really relatable because you can literally take this to your own product tomorrow and think about what decisions are being made and which one of those things can be made by a machine instead. And I've been working on how claims should look for the next generation of insurance. So here's, a, here's like an example, I don't know want to say pitch deck, but like a vision strategy roadmap might look like for an insure text claim system, okay? so. If I have the vision of creating the world's best claims experience uh, picture that I never really thought, like I, I wasn't like growing up thinking I'm gonna go work on insurance, but that's just, that's here. Nobody really thinks about that, but then now I'm working on insurance. Anyways, so my, my mission right now is to create the world's best insurance claims experience, as sexy as that sounds. And there are three pillars uh, that I want to achieve to create the world's best claims experience. It has to be frictionless, fair, and fast. Pretty catchy, right? I think our CEO would actually buy this. Um, frictionless means easy to file a claim, easy to get status updates, easy to provide additional data when needed. Fair means claims that should be accepted get accepted and paid out, claims that are fraudulent don't. And fast means payouts occur within minutes, not days or months, and that teams that work on claims are very, very productive. And so top line, that's my vision. Each pillar here is a strategy within the vision to achieve it, right? So now, if we boil that down even further, um, we have still frictionless, fair, and fast as my strategic pillars, and now I have started to list out features I could build in support of those strategy, strategic pillars, right? And so frictionless, for example, 24-7 support. If, I'm, if I broke somebody's window at 1 a.m. in the morning, I should be able to take a picture and send that to my insurance company as part of beginning to file a claim. I shouldn't have to wait for somebody to wake up and go to work so I can call them. Push notifications, managing in-app, voice, natural language processing, these are all features within insurance claims, and the message is they can differ in terms of how much data-driven 
how much AI ML is used. Or you can actually just hire a thousand people in a call center somewhere and they would actually do this. It wouldn't be maybe the most scalable method, but at the end of the day, you're still making decisions and there are a lot of decisions to be made by a thousand people. Um, so all this is to say, AI is one way to solve your problem. Don't start with that. End with it, okay? All right, now, second thing. AI can augment humans rather than replace them. Um, and uh, coming from an Uber background, I have to show this video because it's just super cool to look at. Like I watched this so many times preparing for this presentation, but it's just really cool to look at. This is the visualization tool that they've built that, to show you what a car sees when it's driving itself. Okay, so this is a compilation of all the sensors, cameras, and data that the machine sees to try to like make a turn, like a right turn there. Okay, so why why is it so hard? to build an autonomous vehicle. Why do you think? Can't look around. Can't look around. Can't look over the shoulder. Can't look over the shoulder. I mean, there are a lot of unpredictable things that happen in traffic all the time. There are a lot of unpredictable things that happen in traffic all the time. Complex. Context? It's complex. It's complex. It's extremely complex. It's like, yes. Yes? There's a question about morality. Morality, yes. That's a really good one. Um, so let's, let's break this down a little bit, because the, this is a really interesting narrative, because I, uh, the slide before was how do you, um, was that AI can augment humans and make us better, give us superpowers, and not necessarily replace us. But of course, like Uber has to answer the question all the time of what happens to other drivers when your cars drive themselves. So let's unpack this a little bit. Within autonomous driving, there are five levels of um, automation that people talk about. Um, so on the very left here, it's driver only. This is just like a normal car that's, that's basically not automated, if you will. And on the very right, you have fully automated, which is like what you see in movies. So cars just drive themselves and you don't have to think about it at all, right? And um, it has kind of, this graphic specifically has to do here, but I don't actually agree with that. But we have levels two and three, which is certain features that a car does, it does for you. So things like Emergency braking when it sends to the car in front of you is getting close really, really fast. It has things like if you start to veer off to the lane next to you and there's a car there, it corrects for you, right? Um, so the idea is that the progression goes from the car is just you're, you drive it to it starts to help you drive and it starts to help you more. And then at some point, this tipping point, which is now all of a sudden cars handle all functions and the driver is intervening. So between three and four is when the driving primarily switches from the driver to the human to the car itself. Now, the thing that I want to emphasize is that there are actually a lot of things about cars these days that use artificial intelligence that help humans become better drivers. Like there are, there are things that you can build, for example, to uh, sound an alarm when it looks like you're falling asleep, for example. Or these sensors that help you react to emergency, emergency situations better. Cars that can detect collisions and call the police for you. And the narrative, I think, has gotten lost a little bit because we all talk about autonomous driving in terms of the thing on the very, very right, which is that cars just drive themselves, even though we're probably like a decade away from that being mainstream, at least. And artificial intelligence actually can help us become safer in the interim. Um, and even if you do get to the level five fully autonomous cars, the ethics question is very important, right? Because in this situation, let's say you're like approaching the intersection, there's some dogs and cats on the, that just run out in the middle of the road. And the car sees, I can either uh, swerve off and save the car, the dog and the cats, but then like risk killing my passengers, or I can run the dog and the cats over. And in a fully autonomous vehicle, somebody had to code that and say, yeah, actually in this situation you do, you do X. And like, I don't even think a human can make that decision. <laughs> I think that's really, really hard. So how do you expect a machine to make that decision? So what I'm trying to say is, 
Humans and machines actually are very good at different things and that humans do not have to be replaced by machines. So what kind of things are machines good at? What kind of things can you take from your day-to-day -day job and wonder if a machine can make these decisions for you? Here's kind of some things that a machine, um, problems that a machine would be more likely to be good at. So for example, access to well-structured, high-quality, machine-readable data, high volume and frequency of recurrences, so you can have a lot of instances of the same thing for it to learn over when data about the past actually predicts the future. Um, I'd be curious to see if anybody can write an algorithm to predict the next digit of pi based on the previous. I think it's not doable because it doesn't predict itself, right? So you can have like millions of digits of pi, but it still doesn't predict itself. Um, Well-defined notions of success and failure, it needs to know what good and bad looks like so that it can adapt to it. And minimal judgment is required, so ethics questions, for example, really, really hard for machines. What this adds up to is that machines need a lot of structure and it needs humans to give it structure for it to operate it. On the right here, how many people have heard of the Music Genome Project? Really? How many of you have heard Pandora? In your music service. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, so this, this is like a, a um, snippet of uh, dimensions from Music Genome Project. Mu music Genome Project is sort of like named after the Human Genome Project. It's a group of researchers went around and gave music 450 dimensions or something like that. And then they, every song gets scored on those 450 dimensions. And based on those dimensions is how Pandora calculates similarity <laughs> between music. And so it has things like Level of vibrato and lead vocal, uh, lead vocal sound, nasal, lead vocal sound, thickness, prominence of percussion, prominence of horn section. So even something as subjective as music first got turned into this like very, very structured 0 to 10, 400 dimensions before it could be consumed by a machine. Okay, so this, this is the difference between what this is the kind of preparedness you have to have in order for a machine to, to solve problems for you. Um, and there are just a lot of examples where humans and machines actually work together to create the best thing. It's not one replacing the other at all, right? This is sort of at a high level how the Pandora music engine works. You'll notice the most, two most important inputs into the algorithm are actually human feedback. So this is whether people thumbs up or thumbs down a particular set of songs and that's the Music Genome Project categorizations. And all the machine does is put the things together and then spit out a list of songs for each person, right? So, put another way, um, here is a framework that I use quite a bit in terms of how to identify where to use machines to give human superpowers. So, on, X, on the X dimension, there's if you think about the value add of what, what decisions or mach you want machines to do, and you map them out on this, this grid. On so the x-axis you have from routine to really nuanced, and on the x-axis you have informational to action. And as you, you will find that as you move more and more to the top right, it becomes increasingly hard for a machine to solve those problems. And on the bottom left, machines generally are better at it, um, so, an example of this could be like, uh, in, what's, what's an example of something that's informational and, and super routine? It happens all the time. Letter sorting. What's that? Letter sorting. Letter sorting, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, I, yeah, computer vision is hard, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. Netflix recommendations, I would actually say, sits here because it's doing, uh, it's using data, it's computing something, it's telling you something, it's not actually doing anything yet. Maybe like uh, calculating a route, uh, calculating a route, like on maps. Calculating a route on maps, yeah. In a car driving example, this would be maybe something like, uh, Displaying how much, how many kilometers you have left in your tank, based on past driving behavior, for example, because it doesn't really, it's sort of more of the same, more or less the same algorithm behind the scenes, regardless of who's driving, kind of. Whereas like informational nuance, 
would start to be things like reading your face and telling you when, when you're falling asleep. Hmm. Because everyone's face is a little bit different, it doesn't happen all the time. Um, and the action starts to become like, routine action might be like driving on the Autobahn without traffic. <laughs> right, because you're, you're kind of driving straight and there are some rules you have to abide by, but it's like more or less easy. And, and it's proven like in, um, Self-driving cars have driven like thousands and thousands of miles on highway, but can't handle a stop sign, for example. That's, that's the, the difference in complexity there. And of course, like um, something that's like an action that you want a machine to perform that's really nuanced might be like driving through a construction site or something like that. And that's really, really hard. Uh, so think about this. It's useful for me. I hope you find it um, useful as well. Okay, number three. Focus on the evolution of data rather than the algorithms. Um, at that conference, people were talking about like neural networks and whatever algorithms and how they're applying it to the data, but um, at the end of the day, insurance companies today just don't actually have that much data. Um, and it's just interesting to hear people talk about algorithms when you ask them what data set they're gonna run it on and it's not really clear how that would actually change the game. So let's come back to our decision-making, automated decision-making um, definition. And just real quickly break down like five components of decision-making, which is you define a decision, you inform the decision, you make a decision, you measure the outcome of the decision, and then hopefully you learn from the outcome to then make the next decision better, and that's kind of the whole point, yeah? Um, so in an example, back, going back to Netflix, Defining decision, what should we recommend to Patrick? That's pretty clear. That's, that's a pretty clear decision that we want to make. Now, how should we inform the decision? Um, if you know how Netflix, uh, the, the algorithm works, it looks something like this, where they look at what I've seen, they look at what I've liked, what I haven't liked, they look at who has liked and not liked things similar to what I've liked and not liked, and then they look at the difference in what I've watched and what they've watched, and the thing that that person who has a real similar profile to me, they liked, they assume I will like. Did that, do you make sense? <laughs> so, so, so let's say I like Pocahontas and Iron Man, so what do you think I would, I would get recommended? <laughs> What's that? I put, I put, um, I put Avatar, but <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's kind of like futuristic Pocahontas, right? Um, anyways, uh, I mean that's kind of how it works. If somebody who really likes Pocahontas and Iron Man, like I do, and then they like Avatar, and I haven't seen Avatar yet, I probably get Avatar's recommendation. Um, and and this is kind of how it works. Sorry for the blurry, um, blurry graphic, but basically, if I like A and B, and somebody else likes A and B and C, then they recommend uh, C to me. That's called collaborative filtering. Um, so, so we make the decision and we measure the outcome of the decision. So this is where it gets really interesting because how do they know that the recommendation worked? And there are all these metrics they could track like my actual rating on the, on the movie, whether I clicked on it, did I watch a trailer, did I add it to my list, did I finish the movie or only watch it halfway? Did I refer anybody as a result of watching this movie? And they used to have this UI, and I'm so sad they changed it because I think the stars are more interesting. And they would actually show me like my guess and then how it compares to the rest of the people who have rated it. Because um, it kind of shows you a little bit what's happening underneath the covers. Um, but the most important thing that you have to think about as a product manager especially, if you wanted to be using um, machine learning techniques is this slide, which is not only do I recommend C because of someone similar to you, how did you react to C when we gave it to you? Did you finish it? Did you like it? Did you rate it poorly? Because this outcome necessarily should affect something here. And in their case, it is my similarity score. So if I like C and that person also likes C, that me liking C makes me even more similar to them, which means next time around they'll weight the movies from that person even more when they're trying to calculate which ones I should get. And if I rate it differently, then actually maybe I need a new best friend, I need to find somebody more similar, yeah? So in your product development cycles, 
please, please, please factor in time for this loop creation, which is that your data has to evolve. I don't care which algorithm you use, if your data doesn't evolve, it will not get smarter. This is why it's very hard for Bing to catch up to Google, because Google has click-through data for 10 years before Bing started doing it, and it's a problem of data, and data has to evolve. Um, so in summary, I kind of snuck one in there in the beginning because uh, because I think the definition itself is a good place to start, which is defining AI loosely can help you think about your problems and think about where to apply AI and where not to apply AI. Anytime you're, you're making decisions and you want to scale those decisions a certain way, you could consider AI instead of doing it yourself. And then number one, AI is a tactic to help solve problems. It is not a vision, it is not a strategy, it is a way to solve problems. Number two, AI can augment humans and give them superpowers. It doesn't have to replace them. Number three, focus on the evolution of data rather than the algorithms. I think that's it. Add me on LinkedIn, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you so much. Questions? Oh, lots of them. Start here. All right, so I understand you guys are a startup um, and you need training data that you don't have. How do you? Currently, make sure that your products, or AI products, are any good. Any good, specifically in terms of uh, artificial intelligence, or in yeah, general? I mean, yeah, in general. Well, maybe you can describe your first use case and of, how you make sure that you have training data for it. Of AI. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, there's a reason why I define it loosely, is because uh, I think a strict machine learning uh, engineer would say we're not really doing AI yet. We have lots and lots of decision trees. And to be fair, the decision tree was the first thing I learned in my machine learning class. It is automating decisions. And as long as the tree evolves over time, it's AI. Um, but the, the current AI is, as we have um, built it, is, is just a time savings efficiency play. So like when you file a claim, for example, you get asked like 15 questions. And you can either do that on the phone or you can do that via a chatbot, and the chatbot just answers the questions, records the responses, and sends it to a person. Um, we're starting to get some really interesting stuff there, though, where you can, for example, you can um, pretty accurately predict fraud by looking at the pixel density of like documents people upload because your phone camera has a very different uh, distribution of pixels than like a PNG off of Google. So, so there's, right now it's all for us about data collection and um, it'll be really interesting down the road because in 10 years, how you interact with like a carousel of photos in an app is going to um, in some ways decide how much you should be charged for your insurance policy because it's behavioral data that gets captured and becomes a part of your risk profile. That is years and years away. Uh, I don't think I even answered your question. But <laughs> you, you said you don't have any data, so you're not building any. We're collecting training. data. That's yeah. but I mean the pitch at like conferences is we're doing AI and you know <laughs> it's a PR play. I mean these people are uh, are trying to you know trying to sound cool and we have to sound just as cool. But, uh, uh, hi. Um, so thanks for the talk, that was helpful. Um, to the Netflix um, example, uh, one comment and one question. Yeah. Um, uh, you said you like the, the star rating, and yeah, it's very informative, but they switch it to a match score in percent, which sounds much more scientific, I think. So, <laughs> right? <laughs> it, it sounds pretty much like, yeah, we, we exactly know what you want, I feel. Um, um, and it it turned uh, it occurred to me that the rating uh, thumbs thumbs up thumbs down is not really like asked for like it's there in the UI but how often do you do this not it's like you're not pushed to it you push to the next content so I assume they using the signals that you mentioned the other ones uh, way more do you have any opinion on why or if that's better anyway or something like that I mean I don't. I didn't work there, so I don't know this exactly, but my guess is they did an A-B experiment where half of the people got stars and half of the people got thumbs up, thumbs down, and they got like 
more responses to thumbs up and thumbs down because it's simpler and decided that the trade-off of the data is the volume is worth more than the granularity of the responses. That's my guess. So sorry, my question was different. Yeah. Even the, the, the thumbs uh, rating is not even asked for in the sense that they, at the end of the movie, they ask you, please rate it, yeah. but instead, it's like you an icing on the cake and they mo use more the implicit data in terms, it seems to me, like which did, things did you click on, did you yeah. finish it and so on. Do you have any um, idea on, uh, on if that's useful more anyway to, to use these kinds of implicit signals? I, I think absolutely. I mean, I think behavioral data is in many ways more, more of a signal than somebody rate, rating a movie. Like, it's, you can rate a movie five out of five and then not even finish it, and then is Netflix supposed to, like, believe that you like the movie? I don't know. I, so I think the implicit data is more important anyway. Um, and, and probably for them, when they were starting out, the, the crowdsourced seeding of training data was probably so valuable that they were like, oh my god, just click the stars, please. And then now that they've gotten so many users and so much scale, like, enough scale to create a movie out of data, like a whole series out of just data. You know what I'm talking about, right? How's the cards? That was a machine generated like series they should make. That was not them being genius uh, directors. That was the machine saying, you should do this. Um, and that Will Smith movie uh, that with the aliens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of scary, but yeah. So like, I think now they're at a scale where it's like, okay, if you watch a trailer, it means X. If you finish the movie, it means Y. I don't really care if you thumbs up or thumbs down. I kind of care, but I mostly don't. That's my guess. Yeah. Thank you. More questions? Hi. Uh, Hi. Since you're in insurance, I guess that uh, you already know what home economicus is, and that actually leads you to some assumptions then the question is, uh, which assumptions uh, that you had at the beginning were wrong, and how do you prove them? Home economics? Sorry. Home economicus. I don't know that word, I'm sorry. Can you explain it to me like I am a five-year-old? Or somebody? I'll, I'll give it a try, just uh, it, it, it uh, states, that the, the, the idea of the Homo economicus uh, comes from, from economics, it states that actually your, your ideas are, are rational and, and uh, they lead you to, to maximize your profit uh, from, from uh, any behavior you have. Yeah. So you want counter examples of where we were wrong, yeah? In, yeah. yeah. What was the, 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 the biggest uh, or, or the, 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 the easiest way to, to, to prove yourself uh, wrong on some of the assumptions that you made, probably based on, on, on that idea, of that principle? Yeah, I mean, the... The economics of insurance at a high level is actually pretty simple. It's, it is completely a data problem. It's the idea that you take something or you take a person and you decide like what is their risk, which basically just means how much money do we expect them to in, like, incur in terms of claims and how much more can we like slap on top of that a little bit and then like charge that, because that's the margin, right? And so that's like, a perfectly profiled risk that's how it works. And so we can really easily compare um, our assumptions against the effective, in the, in the industry it's called loss ratio, which is like the percentage of money that we pay out for you in your claims versus the amount of money that we charge you for your premiums on a monthly basis. And there was one example we've already started to see, which is, I think my, I originally thought, um, so f context for everybody, when you buy insurance on GetSafe, there are like, let's say you buy liability insurance, you have to answer like five questions in a web, on a website, and that determines your price, and then when you finish that, you can have an insurance policy, you can download the app and manage it through the app. So we measure the time between when you first started the funnel and when you check out. And the initial sort of naive assumption was like somebody who is like really tech savvy will just like fly through that funnel and, and then they'll be, you know, low risk because they know like what they want, they're there, they, they know like technology really well, they're exactly a target group, you know, millennials, like they grew up with technology, they're not gonna struggle with like a couple of web form elements, right? And what we found was that actually the people who took longer um, are more profitable because we're guessing they took the time to read the fine print of the insurance policies. 
<laughs> and these people are probably more thorough, and whereas like the people who are really fast were just trying to buy an insurance policy so they can file a claim that happened two days before, which is not a valid claim. Um, so that's like our hypothesis right now. But there are some of these trends that are starting to emerge. In insurance specifically, um, this is exactly what we're trying to find. Uh, and this is exactly what uh, the industry needs to find for that next generation of products to appear. Is these trends that we, like a lot of things that you're paying for now probably uh, won't be the case in five or 10 years. And you will wonder why you had to pay for that at some point because uh, somebody else is in your risk pool and responsible for your premiums in a certain way. Uh, so did I answer your question at all? A little bit. Okay. We don't know yet. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the, the gist of it. Yeah. Last question. Yeah. So you're basically selling insurances. How many insurances do you have personally? Myself? Ah, that's a good question. Well, um, I moved to Germany, so I think I had to buy a liability policy. That's like apparently a rule here. That's not even like a thing in the US. Um, so I now have a liability policy, and then I up upgraded it to include my girlfriend. So I count that as two. And then I have an insurance policy on my house in Seattle. So three. I don't own a car. That's it. <laughs> Cool. All right. Um, please uh, give a big applause to Patrick. All right. I think uh, that's it for uh, like speaker wise for today. Um, we'll still have time to stick around. Um, we put on some music. There's still drinks. There's still cold pizza. Um, if you're too warm. Uh, maybe we get some fresh air in and you're still happy to stay around and yeah, thanks everyone for coming and hope to see you next time. Thank you.